Welcome everyone to the final class of AE311. I appreciate your time and efforts all throughout the semester. And I uh, would like to take this opportunity to review what I consider to be the most important topics that we've discussed throughout the semester. Um, this format is going to follow actually the previous uh, lecture slides. So what you're gonna see is I'll start each section with um, a title slide like this one so that you'll be able to immediately identify which lecture the source slides come from. Uh, you'll notice the, um, the, the navigation bar and the slide numbers that I'm providing on each of these slides also correspond to the original lecture. So that way it'll make it relatively straightforward for you to go to my lecture collection online if you need additional help on any of these topics, uh, and you'll be able to zero in on exactly where those topics were discussed originally. Uh, today, we're just going to cursely uh, cover each of the topics uh, just to give you an idea of the scope and uh, what I'll be looking for in the final days of this class. So we'll start clearly with layers of light, the very first lecture uh, in this class. And there were a variety of things we discussed because this is more of a scope lecture, but really there are two things that I consider foundational to my practice as a lighting designer myself. So what they are is first and foremost, this is the most important aspect of layers of light, which is the types of light. So uh, the most important types of light in uh, architectural lighting design are the above, specifically ambient task and accent lighting. So those three types of light are see, see widespread application within architectural lighting design. And this is why I want you to remember these types of light. When you're giving your final design presentations uh, and also when you're crafting your final design reports, this is a great way to discuss light. These are familiar terms to any lighting designer and, uh, and it really helps clarify the way you intend to utilize your lighting. So we have up here at the top two different versions of ambient lighting. Ambient lighting is that broad diffuse light that provides the base illumination in any space you're designing. The placement, uniformity, and brightness of your ambient light sources are all central to the next topic we're gonna to discuss, which is the Flynn modes on to task lighting. Essentially task lighting is what we're utilizing uh, when we are dedicating a light source to a, the visual performance of a specific visual task. Now there are a variety of reasons we use task lighting, but this is gonna depend on the particular space and the way you anticipate that space to be used. And then finally, the last core type of light is accent lighting. And this is what I consider to be the heart of the, the design aspect of architectural lighting design. Accent lighting can add depth and contrast to your designs. Um, you can reinforce that with shadow or relative brightness, as you can see right here next to me. And the point of accent lighting is that it adds interest by highlighting architectural features or points of interest. You can also use accent lighting to draw focus, especially for pathfinding. And of course we have the Flynn modes. Now, I would never suggest that these five modes are exhaustive of architectural applications, but nonetheless, they're a great starting point for structuring your thinking surrounding the idea of the psychological impression your design can create in a space. So the core five are, as you see above, preference, relaxation, privacy, spaciousness, and visual acuity, all highly useful within the architectural realm. The core aspects of the way you get to each of these impressions are essentially three main elements. And these are the original three elements that John Flynn studied in his original research. And that is the placement of light, whether it's in the middle or towards the edges or perimeter lighting, uh, the uniformity of the light. Do you want it uneven or do you want it very even? 
and finally the brightness of the light and mixing those three elements can create very different impressions within your space now i would add to that one more design element and that would be cct because warm tones can very much enhance the feelings of preference relaxation and privacy whereas cool tones are much more effective for creating feelings of spaciousness and visual acuity. Moving on to vision and perception. Now, you will see some elements of vision and perception on the quantitative exam. Uh, naturally, this ties in with color. Um, and so part of vision and perception are just some important elements, some major takeaways from the course that I'd like you to take with you individually because they're useful knowledge about lighting in general. We have the parts of the eye, and I will expect you to understand the basic uh, functions and structures of the eye. So here is the complete roadmap of the key elements in the eye that contribute to or modify the way we see things. Zeroing in on one major function, which is adaptation. So there's several processes at play here that allows for adaptation, but the, fun the basis is the same. The idea here is these are processes by which the eye adjusts to a massive range uh, of luminance levels. And so just to give you some grounding here. Um, if, if you recall from our photometry practicum, direct sun can be as high as 30,000 lux. So that's incredibly bright, and yet your eye can adjust and compensate for those extremely high light levels just fine. Now, on an overcast day, it's going to be more like a thousand lux, and that's also the light level most typically used in studio lighting. So if you think of a TV set, or new set, for example, that's roughly what those light levels are at. Now, more commonly in architectural spaces, 400 lux is a typical recommendation for reading and writing. So it's a common light level for classrooms, for example. Your living room, on the other hand, will be as low as 50 lux, which is much more comfortable and relaxing light level. But we can adapt to much lower light levels. For example, the full moon is only half a lux, so a clear night. Uh, with a full moon in the sky is only a half a lux, and starlight alone is 0 0.001 lux, which is an interesting aspect because that is roughly where your fully scotopic vision kicks in, meaning your rod only vision. And so we have three visual ranges we have the photopic, scotopic, and mesopic visual ranges. Photopic is your high detail color vision, and this is the visual range we spend most of our lives in. So this is anything above 10 candela per meter squared, talking about luminance now instead of illuminance. And importantly here, we have this function right here. So this scotopic spectral sensitivity curve on the, in the green line is also what we call the V lambda curve, and this is what defines the lumen. This also means that the peak sensitivity of that curve at 555 nanometers is the wavelength of light we're most sensitive to. So this is a green tone, and in fact, this is why green lasers are so common and so powerful, because they sit right in the center of our spectral sensitivity. Now, our rods are sensitive to uh, shorter wavelengths, higher energy wavelengths. Um, however, there's a ton of overlap there. Our rods are overall much more sensitive, which is why we use them for low light vision. We have more of them, they are more dense, and they are more responsive to very low light. Now, the problem with scotopic vision is it's low detail. Most rods are not in the fovea. That's where most of your cones are. So you don't get that high detail vision from rods like you do with cones. Also, you don't get any color from cones. There's just 
one type of cone and the way we experience color has everything to do with the way our brain compares the stimulation of our three different cones. And finally, what rhymes are really good for is both very low light levels, but also detecting movement. So the example I love to give there is when you're watching a meteor shower, if you want to spot those meteors, what you want to do is focus on your peripheral vision because that's better at detecting motion before you snap your eyes over to see it in good detail using your fovea. And again, these ranges are very distinct. Scotopic vision uh, only being really fully kicked in until we're basically down to a moonless starlight level of light. Uh, whereas photopic vision is anything above 10 candelas per meter squared. Mesopic is a mixture of the two, and that's why your uh, color discrimination decreases as you decrease across the mesopic visual range. Moving on to the spectral power distribution. So much like we characterize our sensitivity with a curve across the range of visible wavelengths, we also characterize our light sources in much the same way. So here's a great example of three common light sources. In the red, you have an incandescent light source, which is essentially a black body radiator. It's a very smooth, complete curve because it's a black body radiator. Um, but it also means that most of the light production uh, of that source is actually going to happen all the way over here because that curve just keeps on going up as you leave the, the range of human vision. Now, here's a curve that I really uh, want you all to understand because this is the fundamental way we create white light with architectural LEDs. So you see two humps in this LED curve in blue. And what that is, is a blue LED. So this hump right here below me is the direct light coming from the blue LED. And that LED is underneath a yellow phosphor, usually a YAG phosphor, yttrium aluminum garnet. And that's this broader hump because what it's doing is absorbing that blue light and, and smearing it out across the visual range to create a composite white light. So that's the fundamental method we use for creating white light with LEDs is a blue pump and a yellow phosphor. Moving on to designing for human vision. Now, these are some elements that I think are very important takeaways uh, for you uh, personally uh, with a dash of final material thrown in. So again, uh, we'll start with the eye, and here's our full roadmap. And the topic here is the aging eye, and this will come up uh, on your quantitative final. So there are three major things that, uh, that drive the age-related effects in the eye, and that's reduced light, reduced accommodation, and slower adaptation, which all amounts to lower visual acuity as we age. So we compensate that for that with more light, higher contrast finishes, and more uniform lighting. So with all of that in mind, um, that becomes one of the key aspects we consider when we're determining our design criteria, which is the age of your typical observer in the space. If you're designing for older observers, you do need to provide more light and more uniform light. And that'll be reflected in tables like this in the IES design guides, which provide you specific illuminance criteria associated with particular visual tasks. Now, some of the things that go into that are size, contrast, time, and safety-related concerns. But really what I want you to take away from this is when you define your task, the two main criteria you need to define is your target illuminance, also the gauge. Is that a maximum or an average you're trying to hit or maybe a minimum, right? So if you're talking about illuminance on a projector screen, that'll be a maximum. You don't want to go above it. Whereas 
for the work plane of say a dining hall, it's going to be an average. So you just want to be within 10% of that value. The other aspect to consider is uniformity. Decrease uniformity is going to decrease visual performance and make it harder to perform those visual tasks in the space. So that's how we get our design criteria and why we mostly adhere to it unless we have specific design justification for ignoring those criteria. The basic process here is what I'm showing above, which is essentially we start with defining our visual task and we anticipate who our observers are, and that will allow us to select design criteria from the table below or one like it based on the type of building and the type of space and the type of task. Two important things, uh, two important forms of glare. Uh, we'll start with veiling glare. And veiling glare is what you see to my right here, uh, which is basically a form of glare that conceals an object or, or, a, or a task, right? So this is primarily something that happens with specular surfaces. In other words, surfaces that have a direct reflection component to the light they reflect, as opposed to Lambertian surfaces, which are perfectly diffuse. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So when we're talking about specular surfaces, we can have veiling glare, essentially reflections of the light sources in the, in the uh, surface, which conceals what's beneath it. So the major factors here, you can see uh, in this diagram, you have to consider where your views are located. And this is kind of a classic example here, right? So you, you have uh, a person standing in front of a wall viewing a painting, and there's a sheet of glass protecting that painting. So you have a specular surface, but you don't want to conceal the painting below it. So what do you do? You make sure your lights can't be seen in the reflections on that glass. And you do that by determining the typical location of your viewer, the viewing angle, and the reflection angle keeping in mind that the angle of reflection is always equal to the angle of incidence. So if the, uh, if the light comes into the plane at a 45 degree angle, it will leave the plane at the other 45 degree angle. So it's a relatively straightforward solution. We simply place our lights in the concealment zone, which is just the area uh, at which the angles are too high, so the angles of reflection end up down here where you wouldn't expect people to be when they're viewing the painting. Direct glare, uh, which is really one of the cardinal sins of lighting design. And this is why we specify our luminaires with a variety of shielding devices to prevent you from seeing the light source directly. Now, the factors that go into this are the, the source luminance or, or the amount of light uh, directed towards you from that source, the size of the source. So you can have the same brightness or the same luminance coming from that source, uh, but if it's in a tiny little LED package, that's going to be much harsher on your vision than if it was a larger light source or that same LED placed behind some sort of diffuser. Um, background luminance is also a crucial factor, and this is why uh, headlights glare so harsh at night, because your background luminance is very low, and those headlights are very bright. And so that contrast effect intensifies the direct glare. Finally, the position in the field of view. If it's directly within your line of sight, Again, for example, a car coming towards you on the highway, it's going to be much more problematic. This is also why we spent a lot on optics development on cars so that these headlights can't shine up. It's a real safety concern. Okay, 
this is just a takeaway that I think is valuable to you personally. Uh, this is from the Color Practicum. So you won't be able to find this in my lecture series, unfortunately. Uh, however, uh, I think it's uh, a very worthwhile thing to uh, know and remember. Essentially, we have three perceptual scales uh, that are in common use to describe color, for example, on your computer. The first one is hue, which is essentially the tint tone or shade of a color as you go around as you go around the hue wheel. So that's essentially our hue wheel or our, our circle of color. Uh, and that defines the range of different hues. Now at perfect saturation or when you move uh, away from the center all the way to the outside, uh, at perfect saturation, those are associated with specific wavelengths of light. So that gives us our second axis, which, axis, which is typically uh, referred to as saturation, but you also might come across the terms, depending on what software you're using or what system you're using. Um, you might also see the terms chroma or colorfulness used to describe essentially the same attribute. And that is basically the, um, the richness or purity of the color uh, going from a single wavelength at the edge of the human color gamut uh, all the way to a gray tone at the center of the human visual gamut. Which brings me to the last perceptual attribute. So this vertical axis here, which we oftentimes uh, omit from our chromaticity diagrams, is the axis of lightness, which is also sometimes referred to as the value or the luminance of the color. And essentially what we have is an axis of black to white, uh, and it is our axis of grayscale. Moving on to something a little more directly applicable for you. Here we have the CI 1960 chromaticity space. There's some basic elements here. Essentially, we have, again, at the edge of the gamut, we have our spectrum locus uh, all the way up here. And the spectrum locus going around this horseshoe are pure wavelengths or pure colors or maximum saturation, if you will. We also have the purple line, which is an imaginary line because there is no edge like there is with the spectrum locus. This just fades to black. But the most important attribute of these chromaticity plots is right here, our black body locus, which is also similar to the daylight locus. Do you see it there? It's there in blue, actually. And you'll notice that it's very similar, and that's because the sun is essentially a black body radiator. What we use our black body locus for is to define the CCT of a light source or the correlated color temperature on a range of warm white to cool white. Now, the reason why this is useful is this is a key design consideration. And we use these ISO temperature lines to define them. So essentially anything on this line right here is exactly 4,000 K, whereas anything on this line here is 2500K or a warmer white. So let's take a look at that in a little more detail real quick. Here we have a blown up version of that where we focus in on just the black body locus. And so we have here uh, lower, so we have lower CCTs, uh, which are warmer color temperatures um, because science and pop culture don't necessarily agree on that much. Uh, going the other direction, we have cooler CCT or cooler whites or higher CCTs. And somewhere in the middle, you have neutral whites somewhere around 3,500 or 4,000 K. Now, the other attribute that we need to fully define chromaticity is actually DUV. This isn't always reported uh, when you are looking up architectural light sources. So it's a less important design consideration. But the key thing to remember here is that when you, when you move above the black body locus, you're adding a green tint, which is strongly disliked. 
And when you move below the black body locus, you add an M tint, which is typically preferred. So you want to have a negative DUV if possible. Now, the important design consideration here is that warm whites are typically considered more relaxing and familiar. So if that's your aesthetic, then you want to go with a lower CCT, whereas cool whites are considered more focused and crisp. Photometry. We're going to spend a little more time with photometry. So bear with me here. And the, the big thing for your quantitative final exam, I really want you all to understand the key, the fundamental um, quantities in photometry, as well as their associated equations. So we're going to review those equations and quantities quickly right now. So here is our overall diagram and our core quantities. So essentially what we have is start with luminous flux, which is a measure of all of the light a source emits in all directions. So that's the overall output of a light source. And that's essentially the watts per wavelength of the light source evaluated at each wavelength by the, the lambda function again. Now, we can take that luminous flux and bound it by a solid angle. So now it's going a specific direction. That gives us luminous intensity. So that is the amount of light that source sends in a particular direction. When that light interacts with the surface, we get the value of illuminance, which is the amount of luminous flux per surface area. We can also think of that same idea coming off the surface, which gives us excedence. So excedence is the luminous flux leaving a surface, which means the fundamental relationship between those two is simply the reflectance or transmittance of its surface. Now, the final value we have here is luminance, and this is an important one. It's a bit challenging to measure, which is why we usually stick with illuminance as our core design value. However, luminance is the actual value that you perceive. So this is the quantity of light leaving a surface in a particular direction. In other words, it's the quantity of light received by your eye. So here is a really helpful table that basically breaks down each of these values. It gives you the symbol, the original term, the units we use for those terms, and a quick definition to help uh, keep that in your memory. So quickly, we'll break down each of these elements. Surfaces. So surfaces, uh, there are three core ways, and we're not talking about fluorescence or phosphorescence. So barring exotic interactions, essentially there are just three ways light interacts with the surface. It either is reflected by the surface, transmitted through the surface or absorbed by that surface, which means that for normal surfaces, uh, rho plus tau plus alpha is always equal to one. Now, for Lambertian surfaces, which are the most common architectural surfaces, and so this is very important. You do need to understand and be able to identify the difference between a Lambertian and a specular surface because a lot of these equations are only valid for Lambertian surfaces. This equation is only valid for Lambertian surfaces. Essentially, for Lambertian or perfectly diffuse surface, we can model the distribution of light reflected by that surface by this unit circle here. So all of the lines of intensity leaving that surface, whatever angle they're leaving it at, uh, will be bounded just by drawing a circle. So that gives you this relationship here, your cosine law. So if you know the intensity along the normal vector or the vector perpendicular to the surface in question, um, then the intensity at any angle, isoph theta, is simply equal to 
the uh, intensity at the normal vector multiplied by the cosine of the angle. Now, we also have specular surfaces. And specular surfaces uh, oftentimes are not perfectly specular. In fact, very few surfaces are, are mostly specular. Uh, what most specular surfaces do is a bit of glossiness or a bit of shine means that in addition to a diffuse component, you also have a direct component uh, coming off of that surface. So specular surfaces include a directional reflection. These can be image forming. They don't have to be. Sometimes it's just glossy, like a magazine cover, or sometimes it's almost entirely specular and then becomes image forming like a mirror. Either way, the angle of that direct reflection is the angle of incidence. So it's essentially, if you draw this in here, so you, you have this incoming angle, and what the angle of incidence is, is the difference between the incoming vector and the normal vector. So it's this angle theta right here. Yes, this is very important. You need to get your angles right, especially when we're talking about solid angles. If you get these angles mixed up, you can really get yourself lost in a hurry. So essentially, this angle here, the angle of reflection, is the same as this angle here, the angle of incidence. So the angle will be the same on either side of that normal line. Moving on to luminous intensity. Luminous intensity is essentially just flux here, it's phi, bounded by a specific solid angle. We'll get to solid angles in just a moment, but this is our fundamental relationship between intensity and flux, I equals phi over omega. So essentially, the units of candela here for intensity break down to lumens per steradian, or phi over omega. And so all this is is luminous flux bounded by a defined solid angle omega, not any solid angle with the same value of omega, but a specific one. This is a vector quantity or a directional quantity. Here we have illuminance. So illuminance is the amount of flux striking a surface. And we measure that in lux and foot candle. So lux is our SI unit, foot, foot candle is our imperial unit. The difference between those two is 10.76 lux per foot candle. You will need to know this. This will come up repeatedly. Please don't make this simple mistake. Make sure that you write out your units so that you know which system you're in. And it's very easy to convert from lux to foot candle because that conversion factor is 10.76 lux per foot candle. Now, our fundamental equation is as follows. So this is our inverse square law. Um, so the, the illuminance falling on a surface is equal to the intensity directed towards that surface multiplied uh, by the cosine of the angle of incidence. So again, if we have a normal vector perpendicular to that surface and our light is coming in, it's this angle here that we're interested in or angle of incidence. And then we divide all of that by the distance squared because, the, uh, because light propagates radially outward, the intensity of a light source always falls off with the square of distance or our inverse square law. And then we have excedence, which is a very similar value to illuminance. However, note the units here. They are lumens per area, lumens per area. So lumens per foot squared, lumens per meter squared. 
They are not Lux or Foot Candle, even though Lux and Foot Candle break down to the same units. We reserve those terms for illuminance, not for accidents. Now, the relationship between accidents and illuminance is pretty straightforward. Essentially, um, the ratio of M over E is exactly equal to the reflectance of a reflecting surface. Or if we're talking about a transmitting surface, again, we have the ratio of M over E is equal to the transmittance. The only difference between these two equations is where the M is. So if our, if our illuminance is on the top of this surface, then the reflecting excedence is also on the top. Whereas if, our, if we're talking about a transmitting surface, then our excedence is on the bottom. Again, this is only valid for Lambertian surfaces. This is only valid for Lambertian surfaces. Don't apply this to specular surfaces. It won't give you results that are valid. And finally, we have luminance. So luminance is the luminous intensity of the projected area of a surface. In other words, our luminance is the intensity leaving the surface in a particular direction divided by the projected area of that surface. Now, projected area is pretty straightforward. Essentially, if we have this post-it note here, um, this is roughly three inches by three inches, right? So if I hold this perpendicular to you, the the projected area of that is simply nine square inches. However, as I tilt it away, so your viewing angle uh, changes and is no longer normal. So now your viewing angle decreases and that in turn decreases the apparent area of the surface. So this is no longer nine square inches from your point of view. It's only nine square inches from this point of view. We account for that with the cosine of the viewing angle, the cosine of the viewing angle, which is simply the angle between the normal vector, normal to the surface, and the vector connecting the point of origin to your viewpoint. So this is different from the angle of incidence uh, because you're not connecting the light source to the plane you're now connecting the plane to your eye. So that's why we have theta subscript V. We also have one more term that we can, we can calculate luminance values with, and that is simply L equals M over pi. So this is a relationship between uh, accidents and luminance, which is mediated by a solid angle of pi. Now, again, this equation is only valid for Lambertian surfaces. Only valid for Lambertian surfaces. Excedence is only really valid for Lambertian surfaces. Moving on to everyone's favorite topic, solid angles. Let's dig into this a little bit because this is foundational to the way we understand light. This also gives us our candela tables, which are the basis of our polar candela plots, which are essentially a 2D version of the photometric web, which tells you everything you need to know about how a light source distributes light into your space. So we'll start here uh, with the definition. So your solid angle is essentially a field of view from a particular view point. We use the symbol omega in equations, and the unit here is steradian. This is a dimensionless quantity similar to degrees. Now, some basics here. There are four pi steradians in a sphere. So a whole sphere has four pi steradians, which obviously gives us just two pi steradians in a hemisphere. 
So when we're talking about a cosine sensor or all the light emitted by a surface, we're talking about a hemisphere or two pi steradians, which is why we use cosine sensors for our luminance meters, which capture a point of view of two pi steradians. Now, we can define a solid angle using this plot uh, above. And so the solid angle of one of these cones here is simply defined by this equation, which is two pi times one minus the cosine of the, of the central half angle, the central half angle. So if this cone has a central angle of two theta, theta is what we put in our equation. So it's exactly half of this central angle. Now, if we solve for theta, this will give us the visual angle of a disc, or another example would be your fovea. So we say that the fovea has, uh, has a central angle of two degrees, so it only covers two degrees of your vision, or roughly your thumbnail at arm's length. Um, and so if we insert uh, one degree into the value for theta right here, that will give us the solid angle of your fovea. For example. Okay, let's talk about all of this in terms of the way we characterize our light sources with, you know, one of those giant Ghanaian photometers that I showed uh, on the title slide for this. So we're talking here about type C Ghanaian photometry. There are other types. I'm not interested in them for this class. So if you have a light source like this linear pendant right here, what you want to start by doing is defining your zero vertical as straight down. Now, if you have a spotlight, uh, then zero vertical will be straight out in the center of the primary beam of that source. So if you're looking at a PAR lamp or a can light um, or say track heads that are aimable, right? Zero degree vertical is straight out from the center of that source. If we're talking about ceiling mounted sources, it's straight down. That's where we start with zero degree vertical. Then we define our zero degree horizontal as such, which is along the longest axis, along the longest axis of the light source. So zero degrees horizontal follows the longest axis. And that gives us our basis of our coordinate system. And so we can draw that around our light source, essentially like a sphere. So I like to think of this as like Latin long coordinates on a globe, except that we have uh, different values for uh, zero degrees horizontal and zero degrees vertical. So let's look at that quickly in terms of a candela table, which is what is inside of those IES files you've all been utilizing for your light sources in your design projects. So we start with the vertical angle here and keep in mind that zero degrees starts at the South Pole and then it sweeps up to the North Pole. So vertical angle range is just zero to 180 and it goes from the South Pole to the North Pole, which is of course kind of confusing when you're looking at this on a candela table because naturally the candela table starts with zero at the top and increases the vertical angle going down. So it's important to remember that even though we're going down this table, we're actually moving, uh, we're actually moving up on our globe. Yeah, because zero vertical is typically the South Pole and 180 vertical is all the way at the North Pole. Now, we can talk about our horizontal angles and our horizontal angles are basically a, a equatorial sweep around this globe, an equatorial sweep. And you can see that that corresponds directly to the horizontal angles in the table here. Now, the full range is 0 to 360. However, 
based on symmetries, oftentimes these candela tables don't include all of those values. So the first representation of this candela table that describes the way our light source distributes light uh, is right here, and that is a polar candela plot. So essentially what a polar candela plot is the whole set of vertical angles taken um, at exactly two slices, uh, most typically zero and 90 degrees. So you have orthogonal slices through your luminaire. So the vertical angle is defined. Uh, so this is a polar plot, like I just said, and your vertical angle again goes from the South Pole, which is straight down and sweeps around the top uh, to the North Pole, which is straight up. Now the radius on this plot is showing you the relative intensity. So in other words, with this pendant right here, the intensity straight up is lower than the intensity to the sides because this light is trying to spread light out onto the ceiling, which we expect to not be nearly as far away as the work plane below the luminaire. So let's take a look at that superimposed on the luminaire and you can see uh, the 90 degree range, see, because the zero degree goes along the luminaire, right? So there we have just a fairly even distribution uh, down the length of the luminaire, but where it gets interesting is over here when we're looking at the, uh, at the other slice at 90 degrees. And you can see that we have that bat wing distribution as the light pushes out towards the sides to produce more coverage on your ceiling. I'll show one more representation of that. See how it projects onto the wall of this building. You can see that bat wing distribution right there. Now, when you don't see a full 360 degree set of horizontal angles, that simply means you have a symmetry in your light source. Now, if you're talking about a lamps or par lamps or spotlights, they're actually symmetric. So you only need a single slice to define the whole thing, because as you go around that equatorial sweep, every angle is the same. Um, another very common symmetry in architectural lighting is quadrilateral symmetry. So this is going to apply to most pendants and troffers and linear lights. And that means instead of a totally axial symmetry, you have essentially two planes of symmetry, one that goes uh, down the long axis and one that goes uh, across the short axis of your luminaire, which means you only need zero to 90 because this quadrant is the same as this one is the same as that one is the same as the last one. Now you have bilateral symmetry. Uh, so this is common for wall washers and wall grazers. So you no longer have symmetry down the, or symmetry across the short axis because it's preferentially pushing light out to one side, but you still do have symmetry, uh, symmetry um, across the short axis because it's providing light the same way uh, down the length of that luminaire. And then finally, you have asymmetric luminaires like this, uh, this beautiful thing right here. And asymmetric luminaires do, in fact, need to use all 360 degrees. Moving on to design phases. This is kind of the backbone of how we work through any lighting design project. So let's take a look at some of the common terminology used. And I really like this diagram primarily because what it's doing is it's taking a bunch of related terminology and showing you how it relates to each other. So none of these, these systems are in any sort of disagreement with each other. Uh, my preferred four phases that we utilize throughout this class are programming, schematic design, design development, and construction documentation. Uh, for those of you going on in lighting, uh, Sean Good prefers this uh, 
this series. Um, it's a good series, and uh, he's a lighting designer with decades of experience, so it's worthwhile to engage with his thinking on design approaches. Uh, none of these are wrong. It's just good to know how they tie into each other. Now, what is very important is how we determine our design criteria. So we're going to use either the IS handbook, which is what I'm showing right here, or one of the IS design guides, which were provided for you in your design project materials. Now, essentially, we have a hierarchical organization, and the first stop is the building or project type, which will get you to the right design guide or the right chapter in the IS handbook. Then we need to determine the space type. So for example, here we have we have conferencing. And once we determine our space type, we're going to have a whole bunch of different activities and specific visual tasks. The defined visual task is where you want to get to. And you want to find a visual task that's highly relevant to the one you're utilizing in your project. Once we've defined our visual tasks, we can select our design criteria. Now, we have horizontal and vertical design criteria, and which one we select from those two groups is to, going to depend upon your task itself. So if you're reading and writing on a flat surface like a desk, naturally, you care about the horizontal targets. If you're worried about the light level on a projector screen, then you're worried about your vertical targets. Within that, we need to determine the age of our observers because there are very different recommendations depending on the age group. And you'll see that most of the time, the older your observers are, uh, as you move to the over 65 category, uh, the more light you need to provide for them to get the same visual performance for those visual tasks. So then that brings us to our illuminance values right here. And so these are actual values for illuminance. And we want to, uh, we want to always keep in mind the gauge, right? Never forget your gauge because a maximum illuminance target is very different from an average target or minimum target. So maximum is not to exceed, minimum is not to go below, and an average you just want to be within plus or minus 10%. Our other key design criteria is our uniformity target. And uniformity, uh, depending upon how fine the task is or how important it is, maybe there's safety concerns, uh, your uniformity will have a tighter bound like this, two to one. Uh, or for less important tasks like walking down a hallway, you might see the uniformity as high as 10 to one. But these are our key design criteria. and what you need to do to identify them is work through the hierarchy by going to the right building type, the right space type, and then identifying an appropriate visual task. And then from there, we select the correct design criteria as our basis to design from. So we have a couple different uh, ways to represent our design work. The first of those is the reflected ceiling plan. Now, the purpose of a reflected ceiling plan is to uh, provide for ceiling coordination. So you see on this ceiling plan, right, you've got, uh, you've got light sources like this right here, but you've also got things like HVAC diffusers, those big boxes. You have exit signs uh, up here. You have, uh, what else? You have sprinkler heads, speakers. So essentially what a, the purpose of a reflected ceiling plan is, is to coordinate all of the elements that are either directly attached or anchored to the ceiling so that you can, you can determine if there are conflicts and work with the other designers on the project to resolve those conflicts and provide space for all of the equipment that needs to reside on your ceiling. When we're talking about our lighting equipment, and I'm not asking you in your design projects to go any be anywhere beyond just your lighting equipment. That's all you need for this. So what we're what I'm looking for are ceiling mounted luminaires, ceiling mounted sensors, but you don't need to include those in your project. And of course, 
any other equipment coordination. But for your projects, essentially, that's just going to be your ceiling mounted luminaires. Now, this is very similar to the lighting plan, except that the lighting plan doesn't show any of your ceiling geometry and it doesn't show any of the other uh, ceiling equipment. Your lighting plan is just for lighting equipment and lighting controls. So you can see here we have a switch which would be mounted on the wall to control these ceiling mounted luminaires here. But we include both of them because this is the lighting plan. So you'll include all of your ceiling mounted luminaires and all of your other luminaires within that same space, including wall mounted sconces, for example, and also in ground luminaires. Um, they're not very common in, inside of buildings, but outside of buildings, you see them reasonably frequently. So it's all of your luminaires, no matter where they are, um, and some other equipment. The big ones are going to be your controls. So switches and dimmers, uh, please do include those in your lighting plan. It doesn't take a whole lot of extra effort to add that to your lighting plan. You just want to place it in a reasonable location, for example, by the entrances, or if you're talking about task lighting, by the point of use. And then also, um, you would notate here uh, your circuits and control zones or switch groups, which is what you see right here. Now, your fixture schedule. Uh, your fixture schedule is important, and this is why you want to keep the spec sheets for all the fixtures you put in your projects, because the spec sheets will contain all of this information. Now, here is a collection of things that can and likely should be on a fixture schedule. However, the absolutely critical elements are the symbol or an image of your light source or a designator that you're using in your lighting plan. So make sure to connect that to your fixture schedule if that's how you're, you're labeling your luminaires in your lighting plan. You need a quantity, obviously. You need to define the manufacturer and the product. And then this is what I want to see in everyone's design projects. I want to see a product code or a model number. So this is how you would actually order these luminaires. And this is very straightforward. To, to determine, you just work through the first page or so of your cut sheets and go ahead and fill out your cut sheets before you toss them in your appendix. And you're just going to work through that cut sheet, select the options that you want. You've got a lot to work with there. So pick something that makes sense for your project. I'm not asking you to go into excruciating detail, um, but pick something that works for your project. Pick something that has the right light output, the right distribution potentially. Um, and then from there, once you've selected those options, then it's going to be relatively straightforward to add more detail, like the electrical and driving characteristics, the lamping. Uh, so what I really want to see is the um, lumen output and the CCT you selected at a minimum. Uh, bonus points if you can get CRI or TM30 metrics. Uh, and then um, the mounting type. So this gives me a clear indication of how you're attaching and how it's being utilized. And then finally, we have the controls narrative as the last key piece of documentation of your design work. Now, when we're talking about ASHRAE uh, 90.1, in section nine, you have table 1.4.1.1, which details uh, your space-by-space -space control requirements. Now, what ASHRAE is concerned with is outcomes, right? So it's describing a function of the control system. What I would like to see from you is to define that in terms of the manual controls and sensors that we discussed in the controls lecture. So all you need to do is put those sensors and controls in a table uh, and then let me know in your particular spaces which of those spaces have which controls. Just check the boxes. That's all I'm really looking for is a basic demonstration that you understand how the fundamental lighting controls and lighting sensors relate to the control schemes that are that are required by ASHRAE. Another thing that's extremely worthwhile to add to this would be zones. I'm not necessarily requiring it. 
Uh, but it's nice to see in that main space. Uh, Ashray will require you to have zones. You don't have to actually go so far as to figure out the circuiting to make this happen. You can just tell me that you need so many zones, um, and then you can include those in your table. Now, a complete controls narrative would include a sequence of operations, which is a description of the expected functionality of this control system. So oftentimes it's not enough to say, for example, I just want a scene controller because what does the scene controller do? Well, the scene controller is going to be described in the sequence of operations. For your projects, all you need to do is let me know that you want to use a scene controller there, and that's enough to satisfy the requirements. Moving on to light sources, this one will be quick because, as we all know, there is one truly important light source, and that's LEDs, 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 and hopefully soon OLEDs, which are LEDs, and daylight. So we do have a variety of uh, we have a variety of older light sources still in use throughout our buildings. The most common of which is linear fluorescent. Uh, at home, that usually takes the form of CFLs or compact fluorescents. Um, incandescents are being phased out because they are aggressively poor energy efficiency, um, and we're replacing all of it with LEDs. However, this is the range of light sources you typically see uh, in architectural installations today. Now, the reason we're moving so strongly towards LEDs, uh, there's three big, big ones, and that's first off, efficacy. So the reason why it's efficacy, not efficiency, is because we're talking about the lumen output per watt input. Mixed units, we use the term efficacy, if this was watts per watt, we would use the term efficiency. Now, LEDs efficiency is amazing, and it's very common today to see architectural LEDs with over 100 lumens per watt efficacy. That is absolutely outstanding, and it is reliably beating out linear fluorescence, the main competitor in architectural spaces. Now, we still do have, um, we still do have high pressure sodium, with higher efficacy than uh, most of our LEDs. However, high pressure sodium's color is uh, urine yellow. So really not what you wanna use indoors. We can get away with it for exteriors where we're just trying to provide enough light not to smack your head into things. However, in architectural interiors, that, that color is just not gonna fly. So that's why those aren't real competitors. But even with exterior lighting, uh, where we also have metal halides with very competitive efficacy. With these exterior fixtures, LEDs are quickly overtaking them because they are much better in other aspects, such as lifespan. And this is a big one when you're talking about exterior fixtures because the cost of replacement can be quite high. Think about a street light over a busy street or or a traffic light at, at a at a intersection that never stops no matter what time of night it is. The cost of shutting down those areas to replace the lighting there can be absurd. And so when we're looking at LEDs, we're looking at the best lifespan in the game. These things can go easily up to 50,000 hours of life. And in fact, the a lot of LEDs claim as much as 200 or 250,000 hours of life. Now, I mostly don't, don't accept those kind of numbers because that's the lifespan of the diode. The diodes last forever. Um, however, you're gonna have some, you're gonna have other potential failures, electrical failures in the leads uh, or the driver, uh, which will cause that light source to fail before that diode actually dies. But really, with good quality architectural equipment, that 50,000 hours is very achievable. And of course, that leads me to the last key aspect, which is the life cycle cost of LEDs. So you can see how ugly that is for incandescence. 
Uh, but when we're comparing LEDs to fluorescents, it's no contest. LEDs are a mile ahead and they're a mile ahead of literally everything. So these are some of the advantages of LEDs and I'm not going to go too much into them. We covered the big ones, uh, but we, we also have some incredible features in terms of the in inherent controllability of LEDs, including doing some really fancy things with color, which is what I spend my time researching uh, and also customizability. These things come in any form factor you can imagine. And that goes double if you're throwing in OLEDs in the mix. Um, obviously these don't come without any disadvantages. Uh, the big ones are going to be higher initial cost, uh, which is completely offset by life lifetime cost. Um, you have glare. So especially LEDs, not OLEDs, uh, but LEDs can be, you know, like this one right here, they can be intense little point sources and those little tiny point sources, if they're not shielded or diffused can lead to direct glare that's problematic. And then of course we have light pollution potential from LEDs, both because they're blue rich, but really the bigger issue is that we just tend to over specify these things because it's really easy to now. Let's talk about luminaires and this will come up on obviously your design project, but also on the quantitative final. So we have some major components of luminaires, the housing mounting and finish, all of which are configurable, configurable components for architectural luminaires. Uh, we can also configure the lamping in great detail. Uh, so we can, we can change the, source in particular with respect to distribution and total light output. We can change the driver, which gives us more control options. And then we can also change the optics, uh, which will modify the distribution uh, and also modify the glare potential of the light source. When we specify our fixtures, we start first with a cut sheet, and this is crucial, right? Because it allows you to select all your options. And this is the information you need to put on your fixture schedules. Um, it also it crucially allows you to look up your IES files because you need to specify at a minimum the, the optical elements, for example, shielding, uh, the distribution and output of the light source inside that, that luminaire, uh, and aspects like your color. Those are all going to affect the, the way that light is distributed from your light source and will therefore give you different IES files that are correct for the light source that you, you actually want to specify for your project. So it's important to go through this spec sheet first because there are many options when it comes to your IES files. So here's some of the key pieces. Right, so you have your shielding or your optical components. Uh, so for example, um, you have uh, baffles, you have shielding, you have louvers. These are all there primarily to reduce direct glare, cutting off those high angle viewpoints that allows you to see directly into the light source. So specifically, we're talking about those vertical angles that are right up near the equator, if you will, right? Or the angles between 60 and 90 degrees. Those are our high potential glare angles. And those are the things we cut off using things like louvers and shielding. Um, we can also decrease the intensity of the source by adding a diffuser. So that's a great solution. Diffusers also spread the light more. So that's going to change our distribution quite a bit. Lenses and reflectors are other two tools for, for modifying the distribution. And this gives us a lot of control, especially when we're talking about uh, lenses and reflectors, it gives us a lot of control over where we direct our light to. So combinations of lenses and reflectors are how we get those really narrow wall grazers or, or cove lights uh, that will spread light down a wall that light sources right next to.
distribution, 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 distribution. Almost all light sources uh, in the architectural market will come with configurable distributions. Uh, and in the case of the light source that we're looking at right now, you can configure the up light separately from the down light, meaning you can get a bunch of different looks from this fixture. If you want to surface mount it, then you would focus on the down light. But if you're trying to get that Flynn mode for spaciousness, sending light up onto the ceiling really opens up a room. Now, these are crucial for your quantitative exam. Uh, the CIE classifications for the distribution of a light source. So we have five major classifications. Um, and that is direct or a light source that is only down, semi-direct, which is mostly down, direct indirect or general diffuse, where it's sending light both up and down. The difference between direct indirect and general diffuse is the direct indirect is cutting off those glare angles. So you don't have any of that high angle light with the potential to allow for direct views of the light source. Moving on, we have semi-indirect. Uh, which is mostly up. And then we have indirect, which is almost entirely up. And the way we define those is simply by the percentage of lumens within each of these zones, within each of these zones. So if 90% of your light is below 90 degrees vertical, then we're talking about a direct source. Whereas if only 50% of your light is below 90 degrees, then we're in the bottom half of this plot. We're either direct, indirect, semi-indirect, or indirect uh, because the rest of that light is going up. And here's a great view of the way that looks in a space. Okay, I don't want you to know a whole lot about bug rating other than it exists. Um, and they're great for exterior luminaires. The big takeaway here, and the reason I wanted to show this diagram, is primarily the, um, the G in bug. So the, the three pieces are backlight, which is light trespass, you know, puking light into your neighbor's bedroom window. Not so great. Uplight, which is just straight up light pollution. So think our, Think of me thinking about our stadium, which is the single biggest source of light pollution I've ever seen in my life. And they just leave those signs on all night long because that's not savage. Um, but the really important topic here is your glare angles, right? And so you can see here that the, it's defining those glare angles from 60 to 90. And it has this special zone here from 80 to 90, which are the really bad glare angles. You really don't want to emit light at those angles. And finally, we have the configuration of our luminaires. So there are a variety of ways we can configure our luminaires, which will change the outcomes in our spaces. So the dimensions of the luminaire, uh, obviously. So with troffers, we have the standard dimensions, at least in the US, of two by four foot, foot one by four foot, and two by two foot foot, which all correspond to those standard kind of ceiling tiles you see all over the place. Um, so that's common in our troughers. Um, and then with linears, oftentimes you can configure them in continuous lines of light. Specifying our mounting is crucial for your projects. You do need to specify appropriate mounting. Uh, if you have a pendant, you need to specify it as so. You don't specify a surface mount luminaire. And so these all lead to different kind of looks in your space. For example, recess have that very clean look because almost all the luminaire is hidden up inside your ceiling. Uh, whereas surface mounted luminaires can be applied nearly anywhere. And then finally, we have pendants, which are becoming extremely popular because you have much more ability to customize where you send light both up and down. So here are common applications, just breaking them down. And this is not going to show up 
uh, on, on your quantitative exam. However, in your final design presentations, I would like to see you use this terminology correctly. So you have three types of sources that are most commonly associated with ambient lighting. That's our troughers uh, right here, which are typically recessed into our ceiling and come in those two by two and two by four form factors. We have pendants which hang below our ceiling uh, and often are, are linear, mostly linear, uh, and provide nice lines of light within our space. And of course we have down lights which can be surface mounted but are more commonly recessed into your ceiling. And the down lights give you a little more ability to direct the light to a specific place. Uh, we have washers, grazers, and cove lights. These are all related because instead of an ambient uh, fill, these are more commonly used uh, for accent lighting, uh, very rarely for uh, task lighting, except in the case of wall washers, which are great for illuminating things mounted on vertical surfaces. So you have wall washers right here, and the main characteristics you're looking at with wall washers is they're set back from the wall a bit, and they're used to provide a very even illumination across that entire vertical surface. So wall washers are most commonly utilized uh, as accent lighting to highlight visual focal points, or as task lighting to highlight uh, vertical surfaces or tasks on vertical surfaces. Alternatively, we have wall grazers, and as you can see here, they are very close to the wall. So there's very little separation. And what that does is it gives us the ability to really highlight form and texture on a surface. And so it creates that shadow and contrast and can be really quite beautiful, which of course means that they're almost exclusively accent lighting. They're not really appropriate for task lighting. And then finally, we have cove lighting which is again, fairly similar. All of these have very, fairly narrow directed distributions. Um, and cove lighting uh, are going to be fixtures mounted inside of an architectural cove. So they'll be in a pocket totally hidden from view. And typically they function somewhat like a wall washer where they're pushing light out onto a surface. And they can be used as either accent uh, or as ambient fill, for example, in this case here, where we illuminate the whole ceiling to provide a base level of light throughout the whole space. And it provides that really nice shadowless light that indirect pendants do. And our last two important types of light or applications for luminaires rather, uh, would be sconces. So these are most typically wall mounted uh, and they're great for uh, adding accents to vertical surfaces. Uh, occasionally sconces can be used for task lighting, but this is the more common application. And then of course we have decorative fixtures, which can take a massive variety of forms. In fact, there are entire outfits dedicated to designing and building custom luminaires. So you can get one of a kind fixtures like this chandelier, uh, and you can also get, uh, things like this adorable peacock sconce right here. But decorative fixtures have a couple things in common, and that's that they generally aren't any of ambient task or accent lighting. Sometimes they're accent, but they're really just decorative lighting because they're meant for direct view. So it's not about the light they produce, it's about the way they look themselves. They are themselves the visual feature, unlike accent lighting, which is highlighting a visual feature. And just a quick note about markets. We have an absolutely immense range of lighting markets full of equipment specialized for those markets. When we're talking about lighting in AE311, what I am talking about is architectural lighting, either interiors or exteriors. But regardless, what, ar what architectural lighting has in common is extensive configuration options, extensive control options, 
and these are some of the highest performance luminaires money can buy. All right, let's jump into controls. So just a handful of things I want you to take away from controls. Um, first off, the, fun, the foundation of controls. If you're working with controls, if you're setting up a control system, and this is true outside of lighting too, uh, but especially in lighting, there are two fundamental things that you must keep in mind because without these things, you don't have an effective control system. And that's that they must be intuitive and they must be convenient. You're not going to be around to explain these control systems and you're not going to be around to point out where you hid the switches. And so rather than something like this, which might be convenient, but what does that do? Or something like this mess, which it's very clear what it does, uh, but wow, is that not convenient to use that many controls to get what I want? You want to simplify things and hide all of that complexity inside the control system itself and just focus on what your occupants actually want. So when we're talking about controls with respect to your design projects, specifically with respect to your lighting plans, there's just a few things you want to keep in mind when you're tossing your switches and dimmers onto your lighting plan. And that's the location of these controls. So again, we need to keep in mind convenient and intuitive. Convenient meaning these controls need to be located where they're going to be utilized. We need to place them by entrances because if you walk into a dark space and you can't immediately turn on the lights, chances are you're going to leave that space. Or you want to place them by the point of use. For example, behind a lectern. You also always, always, always have to make sure those controls are within line of sight to the luminaires they're controlling. Otherwise, that is incredibly inconvenient because you would have to change the controls, walk around the corner to check them, and then come back. And then finally, and then we need to consider the intuition of the control system, right? So we need to logically lay out our switches. For example, we have three zones here. So we would lay out the switches to correspond to the zones uh, as they're ordered in the space. Clear labeling can overcome that when that's, there's no obvious way to clearly order them. Uh, and then finally, providing redundant controls is actually very important um, at multiple points of entry or multiple points of use um, simply because there are many ways that users will interact with your system. So we have three main manual controls. And so this is really what I want to see on your, on your controls narratives are the manual controls and the sensors you would need to get to the outcomes ASHRAE is requiring of you. The three manual control types that we utilize are switches, dimmers, and scene selectors. A point on dimming. Um, this I think is fairly important. Um, perception of light level is not linear. It is in fact logarithmic. And so effective dimming is actually logarithmic dimming, which gives a more linear impression of the dimming controls. Now, here's what's more relevant which is dimming and compatibility. And you see this all the time, especially when you're using analog controls to control a digital device like LEDs. You're really going to reduce the effectiveness of that light source in terms of efficacy, lifetime, reliability. Um, but the more, more uh, immediately annoying outcomes uh, can include flicker, which is obvious, dead travel, which is when you move the slider up and get no change in the light level pop on when you go from zero and you bring it up, 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 oh, and then it's full on. Um, drop out, which is the same thing in reverse where it, where it turns off before you get to zero. Ghosting, which is a weird one. I did get that a nice example for you all where it's still on even at zero. Uh, blinking, 
Uh, that's just like a complete failure to maintain current. Uh, and then also the, what I consider to be the worst of these, which is the, the noise. So it can be a low electrical hum or it can be a high pitched whining as your, uh, as your light sources declare the torment that you're inflicting upon them. Okay, that brings me back to sensors. So we have three types of sensors. And again, this is what I wanna see on your controls narratives uh, to demonstrate that you have a basic understanding of what kind of sensors would be necessary to satisfy the requirements of ASHRAE. And so those basic uh, sensor types are uh, these three. You have motion sensors, so passive infrared and ultrasonic. So passive infrared uh, is better for large motion, so like in a hallway, for example, whereas ultrasonic can capture fine motions. It doesn't have quite the range, uh, but it has more detail and it can make it over barriers, which means uh, in a place like a bathroom, ultrasonic is the way to go. And then finally, we have photocells, which detect the light level in a space. Uh, photocells are a crucial component of any daylight harvesting system uh, because it can detect the amount of light in your space and respond by turning off lights where they're not needed. So here's just a little bit on PIR versus ultrasonic. Um, PIR crucially requires line of sight uh, and is primarily good for those large movements because you would have to cross multiple lines of that PIR sensor in order to trigger it. Whereas ultrasonic can get little tiny fine movements because it's pinging the space actively, which also means you can't battery power these things. They're also really great because they sense around barriers like in bathrooms. Okay, so this brings me back to ASHRAE. So the thing with ASHRAE is that when you look at these uh, control requirements right here, uh, I'll just pick one, restricted to partial automatic on. This is not your controls, right? There are many controls that would get you here, right? Um, what you need to demonstrate is that you understand what controls you would utilize to create that outcome. For example, restricted to partial on, uh, that just means, uh, and you can get further details. Uh, for example, in this one in section 9.4.1.1C, uh, you can get the details of exactly what they want you to do. Um, but in this case, this is as simple as having two zones of lights uh, and only switching on one zone or have having a manual control set to only bring all of your lights up to 50% on the first, uh, only to bring it up to 50% uh, based off of the occupancy sensor. So it's, yeah, right, restricted to, let me restate that. So we can take the example of uh, restricted to partial automatic on, which means that if you have occupancy sensors in your space that switch the lights on when someone enters the room, which is awesome, super like that in a lighting control system. Um, but if that's the case, then to satisfy the needs of this requirement, that occupancy sensor can only bring the light level up to uh, 50%. Uh, so you can either do that by only bringing them halfway up or by using multiple zones and only turning on part of your lights. So these are in so many ways a list of outcomes or control schemes. And what I want to see is the controls necessary to get these outcomes. All right. One of my favorite lectures to deliver was communicating design for so many reasons. And there's just one thing I want to highlight from communicating design, and that is how much your first and last impressions matter. When it comes to your, uh, your design presentations, I would really like to see you all focus heavily on the intro and the outro because that is what people take away from them and hold on to 
for the longest, those first and last impressions. That does bring me to the end of our review session. Thank you for sticking with me through it. And thank you for uh, being so diligent and dedicated throughout the entirety of this semester. Uh, it's been a unique and interesting ride, and I have really appreciated seeing the quality of work you have all put out throughout the semester, and I can't wait to see your design projects. So thank you again for a great semester, and good luck on your finals.